Hey everyone, it is peak summer reading season and I have been reading up a storm lately. And in this video, I'm gonna share the highs and lows of the books I read in the month of July. As usual, I am going to be using my rating system based on my favorite thing in the world besides books and that is my cat Rusty. First up, I read The Practice, Shipping Creative Work by Seth Godin. For those of you who don't know, Seth Godin is sort of known as a marketing genius or a marketing guru. And he also talks a lot about the process of creating and shipping or putting your creative work out into the world. This book isn't so much a how-to guide of how to be a creative person or how to ship your work and publish it or post it or make a video and put it on YouTube, but rather it's a collection of his insights that he's gained over decades of studying marketing and leading other people to bring their creativity to the fore. One of the main topics that he covers consistently through this book is the idea that it's not enough to just create the work, we have to share it. So this book is a really good piece of inspiration for anybody who has something that they like to do or like to create, but they feel some resistance to sharing it with a larger audience. It actually reminded me a little bit of one of my favorite books on this topic, which is Show Your Work by Austin Cleon. There are a lot of people in the world who have creative work that they'd love to share, but they're hindered by their fear of judgment, criticism, and rejection. So this book is a good read for somebody who needs some bite-sized pieces of wisdom to help them overcome that resistance to sharing their work with a larger audience. However, I will say that like some of Seth Godin's other books, this is more of a collection of random thoughts that don't really have one cohesive whole. So to me, it reads a little bit like a series of blog posts not that there's anything wrong with that. Seth Godin is a great writer and his blog posts are also very compelling, but I might suggest that somebody who's just getting started on their journey towards creating and sharing their creative work, look into some of his other books. For example, This Is Marketing might be a great place to start. I give the practice three out of five Rusties. If you're interested in my free breakdown of the top 10 books to help you show your work, then click on the link below and sign up for my monthly newsletter and it'll be delivered straight to your inbox. Up next, we have what I am going to call the most disappointing read for me in the month of July. I was really excited to read The Bee Sting by Paul Murray. Not only had I heard about this book on several podcasts, people recommending it to me, it was also shortlisted for the Booker Prize, which is usually a sign that it's something I'm gonna be interested in. And when I was traveling around London in June, I saw this book everywhere. It was in displays, in the front of stores, in top 10 reading lists for the summer. So I couldn't help myself and I bought a copy and I decided to tackle it. This is one of those sweeping tales of a family and it shifts perspective from the four main members of the family and they each have kind of their own unique voice and their own vocabulary and most importantly for the story, their own secrets. Under normal circumstances, I love a sweeping epic saga of a family. One of my favorite books is the Corrections by Jonathan Franzen, but this novel was a struggle for me. I really have a difficult time when I don't connect with the individual characters and I'm not necessarily rooting for anyone, which is not to say that I need books to have likable characters. Sometimes my favorite characters are anti-heroes in the traditional Jungian sense, but this book just really didn't work for me. I found all of the characters to either be annoying, frustrating, difficult, or pathetic. It also didn't help that this book was pitched to me as a darkly comic book book or even a comedy, it's not funny at all. And Irish people can be very hilarious even when they're using their gallows humor. This book did not make me laugh. I struggled to finish this book and I'm going to give it one out of five Rusties. If you have any actually darkly funny Irish books you wanna to recommend to me in the comments, I'd love to hear about them. My third read of the month was the absolutely fantastic book, Thank You More Please by Lily Womble. Full disclosure, I know Lily in real life, and so I decided to read her book in support of her, but you do not need to know this person to be convinced of her genius. In this incredibly energizing and inspiring book, Lily Womble talks about the modern landscape for looking for romantic love. It's essentially a dating manual, but it is so much more than that. Thank You More Please is a book about becoming your authentic self 
owning your own desires and seeking love that matches you on the level of where you're coming from in terms of the essence of your true being. Lily shares her own journey from being a late bloomer to becoming a matchmaker to setting out in her own coaching business in order to help people overcome their conditioning that prevents them from finding wonderful and joyful love. So she shares some personal stories and she gives wonderful examples of her clients. The best part is that she gives incredibly practical advice. I love to read self-help and personal development books, and a lot of them don't give any concrete advice to their readers about what they should do in order to make these changes and implement these changes into their world. And Lily does a fantastic job. I felt so inspired by this book in terms of looking around the world and recognizing what things resonate with me, what brings me joy, where can I ask for more and own my own desires, and where can I practice the gratitude of saying to the universe, thank you for showing me this, more please. I honestly recommend this book to anyone, even if you're not looking for a romantic partner. It is not only so inspiring that it makes you wanna go out and do things, it also can be translated to other areas of life. For example, if you're a person who wants to start a creative business or you want to start putting things out there a la the practice, shipping your creative work, then you can read this book and recognize how are there parallels between the other things that you want to do that require you to show up authentically as yourself in the world. I cannot recommend this book enough and I give it five out of five resties. My next book was a book that my book club read. So this was a book I probably wouldn't have picked up, but I was still curious to read because it is in one of my favorite genres, historical fiction. This book was The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. This is historical fiction with some elements of sort of fantasy or magical realism. There's a Faustian bargain at the center of the novel, but this is the perfect novel to describe something that I see quite frequently when it comes to books that are popular, which is this idea of the difference between a premise and a plot. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue has a fantastic premise, which I won't get into too much because I don't want to spoil anything, but imagine what you would do if you were given the power to live forever, but you were never remembered. People were not able to recall who you are and they forget who you are as soon as you're out of their sight. That is a fantastic premise for a book, but a premise is not a plot. A plot means that there's something that happens that drives the characters, either some force of opposition that comes from the outside that they have to fight against, and that might even be something like a time frame, a time limit, a time clock, if you will. And there are other internal plot elements, oftentimes that something that the protagonist of the story or the main character of the story desires and therefore seeks out. And I really felt that while this book has a truly fantastic premise, it was lacking on the plot side of things. There really isn't all that much that the character ends up doing, even though she technically is immortal. And many of the elements of the plot that were introduced in the beginning of the story are not really explored later on in the story. And the book is over 400 pages, so there's plenty of time to explore these elements of the plot. What I found and my book club agreed was that this book was sort of divided between whether or not it wanted to be a sort of hero's journey type story where the main character, Addie LaRue, can live forever and therefore go on some sort of larger quest of either learning or transcendence, or it's a love story. And the book never really commits to one or the other. There are elements of this immortality and endless ability to travel and learn and explore the world that I really felt were kind of just left by the wayside. And then the love story was also somewhat you know, late arriving in the story. And so it wasn't really clear to me that that's what was happening. And what it made me realize is this is one of the reasons why I'm not a particularly big fan of the genre of romance novels, because I enjoy a romantic subplot, but I would prefer that it be coincidental with a larger story or perhaps 
just happens to coexist along with some other plot elements that make for a little bit more of a page turner. And there are themes of identity, love, moralism, and sacrifice that a lot of people will probably connect to, but I'll just say that this book wasn't for me. So I'm gonna give it three out of five resties. On the other hand, my favorite fiction read of this month was the short novel translated from Japanese, the Housekeeper and the Professor by Yoko Agawa. Many people describe this book to me as heartwarming, and for some reason, sometimes that makes me more resistant to reading a book, but this book is 100% deserving of that label. It's the story of a woman who goes to work for an older professor who has memory issues due to an accident, and she is his housekeeper, and it's about the relationship that develops between them, and this sort of beautiful illustration of chosen family and the beauty of things like math and numbers and their relationship to this sort of mystical realm. What I enjoyed so much about this book is not only is it a unique story that represents a slightly different style of storytelling that you can see with translated novels from the Japanese where the focus is really on these unique individual descriptions of moments of connection. So they're less about what quote unquote happens in the book and more about the people and their emotions. It reminded me a little bit of what I love so much about one of my all-time favorite books, The Remains of the Day, by Japanese-born English writer Kazuo Ishiguro. The brilliance of that book is not so much what happens in the novel as much as the relationships between the people and the way that the emotions are conveyed subtextually. It's very enjoyable as a slow, leisurely summer read. And The Housekeeper and the Professor fits right in with that category. I was planning on reading this book slowly, but I couldn't help myself. I read it in about a day and a half because while it is a short book, it also just flows so nicely. To me, it's as if this book is also like a piece of music. I give The Housekeeper and The Professor five out of five resties. Since I'm on summer break from teaching and I have time for my more creative projects, I decided to read the book Two Weeks Notice by Amy Porterfield. This book has been on my to read list for a long time because I know that Amy Porterfield, like Seth Godin, is also a well-known person in the world of marketing. And for somebody who has no background in marketing yet wants to build an audience of people who are interested in the topics that I share about, I felt that it was important to go to the top people in the field and that includes Amy Porterfield. In my opinion, the title Two Weeks Notice is a little bit misleading because it makes it seem that this book is about quitting your job. And ultimately that is Amy Porterfield's hook to get people to read this book. But it's actually about the step-by-step -step process of creating your own online-based business, which for some people might also include eventually quitting their job. It really is a step-by-step -step guide. And like I mentioned earlier with Lily's book, I love when books give practical advice. I felt that two weeks notice was a perfect encapsulation of many different things that I've learned from lots of different spaces, like watching YouTube videos about how to start an online business, from listening to podcasts about marketing and how to present yourself to an audience and build your list. But Amy Porterfield does such a great job, obviously she knows what she's talking about, in providing a sort of step-by-step -step guide that also includes the emotional side of things. So this book really appeals to me as somebody who likes to keep in mind that the journey of being an artist, a creator, a writer, anyone who shares their work with a larger audience is going to bring stuff up to the surface. It's going to bring up those fears, doubts, and the inevitable criticism that one receives when we show ourselves and we reveal part of ourselves to an audience. So. What I appreciate about Amy Porterfield's book is that she doesn't act like this stuff should be easy and emotionally devoid of negativity, that those things are natural and they're invited along for the ride and they're actually part of becoming a successful creator who shares their work with the world. And I give two weeks notice four out of five resties. My final book for the month of July was An Unexpected Delight and that is the book Designing Your Life by Bill Burnett and Dave Evans. These two men are professors at Stanford University who were in the design department and they created a course about designing your life that was intended to help undergraduates at 
at Stanford University to identify what they wanted to do with their lives, most often in terms of career, but not necessarily only that, but to apply design thinking principles to these larger problems of who am I and who do I wish to be in the world? This book is full of practical exercises that walk you through understanding how you feel about various quadrants of your life. They even have worksheets that go along with it that you can fill out. I didn't fill out the worksheets, but I plan to later because I think that this is the kind of ongoing life design work that I'm interested in in general. I'm not just gonna read the book and say, huh, that was interesting. I'm going to slowly but surely over time apply what I've learned from this book. And what I particularly enjoyed about this book is they give examples of people and their problems, which I always love to put things into this kind of concrete way so that I can understand how might this look if I were to translate it to my own life. This book is one I would recommend to pretty much anyone, but in particular young people, uh, college students perhaps who are trying to decide what type of career path they'd like to pursue, or people in their 20s who maybe they're finished with school and they're in their careers, but they are finding some elements of life unsatisfactory, um, or even somebody who's going through a transition because these types of exercises can be really helpful. My main takeaway from designing your life was the difference between ideas identifying gravity problems, anchor problems, and prototype problems. Gravity problems are like gravity. We can't do anything about them. We can't change them. And a lot of people get stuck on focused on their gravity problems because if they look at their anchor problems or prototype problems, they might actually have to do something. And for many of us, myself included, it's a lot easier to stay focused on the things that we can't change because it doesn't require anything of us. Anchor problems are not gravity problems in that things can be done about them, but oftentimes they keep us weighed down and stuck because we are attached to a specific outcome or a specific solution without considering the broader ways that we might approach this type of problem. Anchor problems to me strike me as the most common type of issue that people could actually do something about but really struggle to identify in their lives. So even just having this framing is really helpful. Is this a gravity problem I can't do anything about or is this an anchor problem that I might be able to shift or experience expand my perspective around. And then finally, we have what they refer to as prototype problems, which are issues that we have in life where we can take small, low risk movement towards changing or finding a solution. An example of a prototype problem might be something like we are unsatisfied in our job. That doesn't require that we have to quit our job and move to Mongolia to become a sheep farmer, but instead we can do small, low risk pilots of new ideas, new prototypes, essentially, of changes. For example, is this the kind of thing where we identify one of those little pebbles in our shoe, like, oh, I don't like that I have to start work so early in the morning because I like to sleep in. So maybe you negotiate a different timetable for your start time, or people are looking at this you know, model of the four-day work week. I actually know somebody who successfully lobbied to work a four-day work week, and their company agreed to allow them because their work was so stellar, and that was an example of them making a small change that highly improved their quality of life and they were able to remain in their job and feel satisfied with this change. So prototype problems are essentially times when we identify what might be some small scale tests and experiments where we can research and gather data and then perhaps make a change and do something differently or perhaps uh, create a whole new prototype rather than big irreversible decisions. It's all about kind of designing one step forward at a time. And this is essentially a life philosophy that I already had before I read Designing Your Life. So I highly recommend this book and I might even make an entire video just about the Designing Your Life process because I really felt that there was a lot of gold there. So if you're interested in that video, please let me know in the comments if you'd like to see it. I give Designing Your Life five out of five resties. So that's it for the month of July. I'm already well into my summer reading for August. And so if you'd like to see that video, like and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.